like to uh, introduce Dr. Eric Dow. I'll tell you a little bit about, about him. Of course, his bios, uh, uh, a short bios in, in the packet. But uh, Dr. Dow mm -hmm. is the Associate Professor at the National Security Affairs at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Uh, I'm also faculty of the Center for Homeland Defense and Security at the National uh, uh, Postgraduate <coughs> School. And the, now these centers, what's important, I didn't realize this, is actually funded through DHS, the, the Center for Homeland, uh, uh, Homeland Defense and Security. And, uh, so you may, for, for those folks in DHS, you'll see some of those opportunities, continuing education opportunities come up, to like a master's and things of that nature. And that, that's exactly what, what, what they find. Uh, DHS will send uh, people either to that, if you qualify, or to the Army War College. It's usually the, uh, one to two spots. So uh, 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 Dr. Dell actually uh, works there. His research focuses on intelligence, terrorism, and international homeland security. Uh, on that. And so he's, he's got several publications. He's actually near the end. I'm talking about one of his articles. I think is very fascinating. Ties in into uh, the second portion of, 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 his, uh, of his talk. Um, and he'll give you information if you want to see that, that, that article. But the, uh, the beauty, though, of, of Dr. Dell's experiences, not only he's in the academic world now, but he was a practitioner in the intelligence community with the United States Navy. Um, and so uh, it's very rare that you'll have a combination of those two that, that actually did that, you know, kind of walk the walk as he does the, the as he speaks the, the, the talk at, the, at this point. So, so we're very fortunate that, that uh, Dr. Bell was able to come out here and, uh, and speak about these topics. I would encourage you, uh, as you go through the present, uh, listen to the presentations. It's not a class when you're taking notes, and you're gonna, you know you're going to study for a big test, right? The idea is that the kind of get that, generate some thoughts, and, and ask some questions. Uh, on that, you should, you should really walk out saying, you know, I was thinking about these kind of things, and, and I, I want to know about this. On um, that, if you, uh, there's plenty of time to do that. Um, I, I think his preference is, is to kind of hold those thoughts to near the end on that, but if there's something that you think you're going to forget, by all means, raise your hand and, and he'll, he'll address that. Uh, <coughs> I will tell you, like in, in, uh, um, in most cases, and uh, remember I spent the, uh, uh, half my adult life in, in uh, law enforcement, so easiest way to get people to ask questions is what do you do? The private one with a challenge coin, right? Uh, on the deal, so I have several in my pocket there that I'll end up giving out. For the first couple of questions of each session, I'm, I'm going to do that. Usually, stimulates uh, it's new type challenge coin stuff. Um, and so, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Dell. Thank you. Chief, thank you very much for that great introduction. Thank you, everybody, for coming out this morning. Uh, I'm especially glad to hear there's no test at the end. So, thank you, thank you very much. I'm not sure I would pass that. Uh, what I would like to do is talk with you this morning about two different things. So, two different talks with a break in between. Uh, the first, well, they're both about the general topic of counterterrorism intelligence, how we can make ourselves, our, our country, and our world safer. The first is a general overview of domestic and homeland security intelligence and counterterrorism issues. Then after the break, uh, as uh, the chief mentioned, we'll be talking about a little bit more of an international counterterrorism focus uh, on uh, how we found Osama bin Laden and why it took 10 years to find the most recognizable bad guy in the face of the earth. But we'll, we'll hold that to the, the second part. So right now what I'd like to do is uh, talk a little bit about uh, what I see as a puzzle, which is how does it, how can it be that we appear to today, at least, we're watching the news today, we continue to have terrorist attacks, we have other kinds of school shootings. So many years after 9-11, when we've made so many advances, you would think, in counterterrorism and in, in domestic intelligence, how is it that at least, in some way, by some ways to look at it, we don't seem to be all that much safer today? I'm going to talk about what I think the problem is, I'm going to talk about what we're doing about it, again, kind of a uh, we don't have a lot of time, so as we say in, in the Navy, I'll sort of touch the wave tops of, of these things. Uh, do jump in if there's an immediate question, but, but you might want to hold uh, toward the end uh, and try to leave some time for, for a Q&A on, on these things. But then I want to finish up with what I think is some good news resulting from my research at the Naval Postgraduate School and also as a, a researcher with the University of Maryland Start Counterterrorism Center, which is another DHS center of excellence 
in counterterrorism. So I'll talk, there is some good news here, and I'll offer a way ahead in domestic and homeland security counterterrorism intelligence. But first, what's the puzzle that I'm trying to look at? It's that it does appear that 16 years ago, 16 years after 9-11, we still seem to be having facing domestic terrorism attacks much too often. What, what's, what's going on with that? Haven't we been able to make some inroads in this, just in some of the, the attacks that we've had recently? Our leaders, DHS, intelligence community, <coughs> our national and local leaders uh, have been talking about this. In fact, just last fall, the acting DHS secretary, as the administration uh, is getting ready to turn over, acting DHS secretary testified before Congress that the terrorist threat today equals and perhaps exceeds the threat that we faced at 9-11. So how can that be? We have the 9-11 Commission report, we have the many changes, including setting up the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, a whole new structure within our intelligence community, we set up the National Counterterrorism Center, many other changes. How is it that we're still facing this problem? So what is the problem today? A big part of the reason for our continuing threats is that, as many of our national intelligence leaders have stated, we are facing a more varied and more challenging environment for intelligence, for national and homeland security, for law enforcement, than we have in the past. The former director of national intelligence, General James Clapper, often testified before Congress that the situation that we're in today, to him, after his 50 years in the intelligence community, seemed to be a situation where we are facing, as a nation, more challenges, more threats, more crises than he'd ever faced in that 50 years in the intelligence community. One of our recent chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dempsey, in fact, stated that he believed that the world is a more dangerous place in general today than it ever has been. I tend to think that maybe is a little bit of an overstatement, but I certainly do take the point that for intelligence, for national security, for homeland security, the challenges we are facing are more varied and in many ways more difficult, certainly more difficult than those that I faced during my earlier military intelligence career when we faced pretty much one unified enemy, the Soviet Union. We pretty much knew what they were about, they knew us, and none of us really wanted to go to war anyway. Today we're facing a much more varied set of challenges. Some people, in fact, would argue that the intelligence community today is in a crisis for many different reasons. Some of that is possible confusion and controversy about the relationship between the president and his senior administration and the intelligence community. One of our former CIA directors has said that our intelligence community is in a crisis today. There are reports in the news that many of our top national intelligence agencies are losing some of their best people. But I want to point out that there's always a different side to the coin, and many of our current and recently senior members of the intelligence community would tell you actually that's not the story. Michael Morell, a former deputy director of the CIA, has had a book out recently, and I recommend that you might want to read that if you're interested in these topics. He has argued, in fact, that today is what he would call a golden age of intelligence, a time when we need, we want, and we have more intelligence than we ever have before. In fact, he's even said that if, if intelligence were business, if it were on the stock market, that he'd want to, it would be going up, he'd want to put more money into intelligence. And I think maybe that's a little bit of a, of a too rosy, rosy view. I want to point out that there are different, different points of view. It also helps to look at the terrorist threat today in a longer, wider context. Many of you may know about from reading in American history that we in our country have faced terrorist threats many different times in our past. In 1920, for instance, there was an anarchist terrorist bombing on Wall Street. Still today, if you go to New York City and you go to Wall Street, you can see some of the, the chunks taken out of the masonry from that attack when a wagon was pulled up, filled with dynamite, uh, and blew up with nails, metal pieces, killed 38 people. 
and the shrapnel was found as high up as the 34th floor of the buildings. We had, in the 1960s and 1970s, we had a widespread terrorist threat in this country. And in fact, depending on how you count these things, and part of what we do in the academic study of terrorism is try to count things and try to, try to figure out what, how do you count one thing differently from another. But according to many experts, the terrorist threat in the United States in the 1960s and 70s was even greater than it is today, and it has been since 9-11, in terms of the sheer number of terrorist attacks that took place. I grew up in the 1960s in Madison, Wisconsin. There was a bombing of a University of Wisconsin laboratory one night that killed a researcher in the middle of the night, not too many blocks away from my home. So depending on how we look at it, I think it's important to put the terrorist threat in context today. I'm not sure that I would want to argue that the terrorist threat is, is worse. We have to talk about how we want to, how we measure that. But certainly it does seem to be true that the challenges that we're facing and the, the types and the varieties of terrorist actors that are threatening us are more difficult today. Another one of the challenges that we face is what you might call the paradox of domestic intelligence, of domestic and homeland intelligence. Former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice put this well in testifying after 9-11. She pointed out that Americans are allergic to domestic intelligence. It's sort of in our nature, it's in our history. We don't like someone, we don't like government watching us. We don't want an invasive domestic military presence, intelligence presence, but at the same time, and this is what makes it a paradox, we need domestic intelligence to keep us safe. And we certainly learned that on 9-11, and we continue to learn that with every attack that takes place today. But how do we balance that security and liberty? Is it as simple as putting in more more law enforcement, more national security, more homeland security, more intelligence, and losing a little bit of civil liberties? Is there a balance there? Can we have both at the same time? Can we have more security and also freedom of our civil liberties? That's a challenge. We haven't figured that out. We'll probably never figure out any ultimate answer to that. I would say, though, that we are weakest when it comes to homeland and domestic security intelligence issues. That weakness comes, those problems come, from a number of different reasons. One is the, the legal considerations for intelligence domestically are completely different from the traditional way that our national security intelligence agencies do intelligence. Completely different from what I grew up on. You don't want somebody like me doing homeland security intelligence because I was trained, I grew up on going overseas, doing whatever you need to do, break laws if necessary, in order to keep our nation safe. Domestically, it's not that way. When the dots that we collect and the dots that we connect to keep us safe, maybe you and me, our family members, we have to think about intelligence very differently. Also, the consumers of intelligence, the people that our intelligence and our homeland security and our law enforcement agencies need to work with are very different from the way it works at the national and international foreign intelligence level. When it comes to homeland security intelligence, we've got to be able to, to work with state, local authorities, the public, in ways that really don't happen in traditional foreign intelligence. There's also what I think is a problem with what I call our counterterrorism toolbox. And that problem is that two of the key tools that we use in counterterrorism are handled at very different levels of our national government. Intelligence capabilities are typically handled nationally, and most famously by the big three-letter agencies in the D.C. area and the national intelligence community. But law enforcement, as so many in this room know, law enforcement in this country is largely a local responsibility. The vast majority of law enforcement officers in this country work at the state and local level. That's where most of our capabilities are, that's where the people are who know the, the local uh, terrain. The and so when we have a situation where intelligence is handled nationally, federal laws apply, law enforcement largely handled at the local level with an ability to, to vary the way the approaches will be take, sometimes we, we miss that communication. For instance, some have felt that that was part of what happened to allow the Boston Marathon bombings to take place. Information was available at the national, federal level, Joint Terrorism Task Force level, 
wasn't understood well enough by the Boston Police Department level. Now, there are a number of other challenges that we face in the domestic and also the international intelligence level. We don't have time to talk about all these sorts of things, mm -hmm. but the new uh, capabilities of encrypted communications that we all have in our, in our phones, uh, these cause a real problem that many in law enforcement have called a going dark problem. Communications by potential bad guys are going dark. <laughs> But at the same time, we're able to gather so much more information. As some experts have called this, uh, we are facing a data glut. We have more information that we might use to keep us safe, but we're weak on information, on, on intelligence about it. How to make sense of all that information. <coughs> it's a challenge we're still trying to face. Intelligence, national security, law enforcement has capabilities now for, for through social media, for those phones in our pockets, but how to use that information, make sense of it, and also abide by civil liberties. Decide where, where should our civil liberties maybe end, and maybe should they give away to our security needs? Uh, these are difficult questions that we're still trying to face. And we, we face certainly what often has been described uh, as the first law of intelligence failure. That was a, a phrase, in fact, coined by, by my boss, my dean at the Naval Postgraduate School, James Wirtz, that Every time there's a major intelligence failure, a disaster, something terrible happens, you, when you look back, you can always see there were some warnings there. We probably all have, have felt that. But those warnings seem to have been missed. We've been facing that since at least as far back as Pearl Harbor, and we still face that today. An example of, of how some of these problems happen in our world today are the limits of our counterterrorism, intelligence, and law enforcement capability in Orlando, Florida, before the terrible attack there. As you may know, and all of this information is in the public domain, of course, all, everything we're talking about today is completely unclassified, open source, but the local sheriff's office had gotten a tip about this guy, Omar Mateen, private security guard, something was, was up with him, might be, might be dangerous, back in 2013. Our security agencies and officials worked on that as hard as they could. On the Joint Terrorism Task Force, the JTTF, an FBI agent and a sheriff's deputy worked hard at taking the lead on that investigation, tracking phone records for, for the, the suspect, doing surveillance, interviewing him. They didn't have just one confidential informant that got close to him to try to see what was going on. They had two confidential informants. It took a total of 10 months to investigate, to try to see if there was a, a threat here. He was placed on one of our watch lists called the selectee list. That's not the no-fly list, but a list where people, if they do fly, are subject to extra scrutiny. They interviewed him a total of three times. In fact, extended the investigation because they weren't convinced they'd been able to get everything they could. The investigation was closed in 2014 because there just wasn't any more that they could do. There wasn't evidence that we can use under our laws in this country to arrest him or to do more, to even continue that surveillance. And of course, two years later, he carried out that terrible attack in the Orlando nightclub. As an FBI official said afterwards, we went right up to the edge of what we could do legally to investigate this guy, but there was just nothing there. That's part of the problem. There may have been warnings, there were warnings, but we have laws, we have civil liberties, we have rules, and we also were limited. All of our agencies, all of our organizations, all of our government uh, officials are limited in budget, in time, and personnel. Even if we had the legal justification, can we watch 24 hours a day everybody that we might be suspicious of watching? In this case, the one area that uh, wasn't uh, tracked as much as perhaps it could have been was social media use by the attacker, but it turned out afterward that he hadn't really been giving anything away there. So even if there had been more aggressive uh, investigation of the so social media use, it might not have been uh, successful. So let's talk a little bit about what we are trying to do about these problems in our country today. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we have been, since 9-11, setting up a number of different organizations, including the National Counterterrorism Center, NCTC, in Washington. It's probably the closest that we've got in this country to a, a, a counterterrorism command center, sort of like we see on TV. Well, that's one of the problems that many of us tend to think that, that our capabilities are as good as we see on television. 
just like on NCIS, for instance, you know, let me you know, pull up that, that camera instantly, uh, let's tap into sort of every phone uh, that exists, all those sorts of things. We don't, we're not that good. And, and legally, in terms of civil liberties, we probably don't want our government to be able to, to track all of us every, uh, every time, all the time. But it's not just at the national level that we've made significant strides in improving our counterterrorism, our domestic security posture. We've set up a network of state and local intelligence fusion centers. This is a picture of one of the larger ones in New Jersey, the Regional Operations Intelligence Center, which has provided a great service to people in New Jersey in that region, not only in counterterrorism intelligence, but also in acting as a command post for Superstorm Sandy, for instance, that hit the East Coast using this fusion center, using the communications, the technology, the information sharing capabilities as a, a command and control center during the time of Superstorm Sandy. In fact, we have a total of 79 state and local intelligence fusion centers in this country. All of these have been set up since 9-11. This is a, a new development. Some ask, why, why 79? Is that too many? Is that too few? <laughs> Texas. We happen to have seven. Texas has the most state and local fusion centers of any state in the country. I think here in Texas, maybe the, the view would be that's a good thing. In California, where I come from, we have six. Do we need to get more? Not as many as Texas. Mm -hmm. And the one in uh, El Paso area here is called the Matrix, so some of you may be familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Many of our communities have established what sometimes are called domain awareness programs. That's a term that we used to use in the military. Much of this terminology has been adapted from, from the military. When I was in the Navy, when I was serving under aircraft carriers, steaming around the world, the idea was we wanted to know what was going on within, let's say, 200 nautical miles of the aircraft carrier at any time. Of course, we want to know farther out, but we really got to know that's our domain. We got to know what's going on because basically at that time, anyway, somebody within 200 nautical miles could hurt us. Well, we're using those ideas domestically here today, and some people aren't comfortable with the idea that we are using sort of military concepts and, and terminology. I, I think we need to be open to that, have discussions about that, understand when some people are uncomfortable mm -hmm. with those terms, but then be able to discuss when and, when and if we may uh, need to use those uh, terms. The New York City domain awareness model is probably the, the best known, the picture here of former President Obama visiting the uh, real-time crime center. Many police agencies have real-time crime centers similar to an intelligence operations center we'd have in the military. Other cities throughout the country, just examples here, Camden, New Jersey, some have called it surveillance city. They've developed new ways of, of keeping track and keeping their, their community safe. But in other communities, efforts to set up domain awareness programs like that have met with some citizen objection. In Oakland, California, near where I live in Monterey, uh, the an area that uh, is very uh, heightened, uh, uh, very alert and aware of civil liberties concerns. The, o the city of Oakland and the Oakland police uh, announced a plan to set up a domain awareness system, and there were protests, and it was scaled back uh, to a smaller level. And I think that's that's a perfectly good thing. It's good that these local approaches to counterterrorism, to domestic security, local approaches can be adjusted to meet local needs, desires, capabilities. And it's harder to adjust national, federal level programs that way. Kind of one size fits all at the federal level. At the local level, you can adjust them better. And because our communities all have different types of threats, different concerns, I think it's important to be able to, to address them that way. Many of you probably know we have other uh, tools and capabilities that are being developed. You may have heard of this idea of predictive policing, the idea to, to use past patterns of, of auto thefts, of local crimes, those sorts of things, uh, and use those past patterns to try to predict future uh, future crimes. Where are the areas we need to pay most attention to? A few years ago, Time Magazine called predictive policing one of the, the top inventions of, of the year. And just up the road from where I live in Santa Cruz, California, the police department has been <coughs> using predictive policing, and, and they, they find it's a, it's a useful tool. It doesn't replace the expertise of a long-serving beat police officer, somebody who, who knows knows his or her uh, area. But you can't always, in every area, have a, a long experienced police officer on, on the beat. And so sometimes you need this sort of a thing. 
but you know, people do worry that maybe in predictive policing, I mean, are we are we trying to get to a point like in that movie Minority Report, you know, where Tom Cruise was going you know, to predict whether uh, you know you were going to commit a crime, you, know, you were going to com commit a crime, get arrested ahead of time. Luckily, we're not that not that good. Mm -hmm. But we also have to have a discussion when people get worried about this predictive policing. What are you talking about? We've got to be able to to have discussions about that. At the national level, we've developed a number of new capabilities, a number of new tools. Everybody probably remembers a few years ago, after 9-11, we had that color-coded watch system, you know, the orange, yellow, red, whatever, and everybody, nobody kind of knew just what the different color coding meant, and yet we always seemed to be at orange or whatever, you know, go to the airports and, at airports and you wonder what was going on. DHS uh, eliminated that color coding system and set up a new system that has been adjusted since. And now we have a system that allows DHS to send out what they call uh, terrorist threat bulletins through the National Terrorism Advisory System. And I have an example here on the screen of the most recent bulletin. Do you mind if I just ask, how many, has anybody ever seen a bulletin like this? Anybody know? On one hand, a couple of, couple of nods. And this is in a room of people pretty interested in this topic, so you wonder, whether or not this is really getting out to the people who need it. And also, some people wonder whether or not DHS in these bulletins, are they focusing too much, too exclusively on the internationally connected terrorist threat? You know, ISIS, Al-Qaeda linked, uh, a homegrown violent extremist perhaps that might be inspired by ISIS would, would meet this criteria. But there are many other kinds of terrorist and other sorts of threats uh, domestically uh, that may not be captured in some of these threat systems. We are certainly doing a lot of different things to try to use, tap into technology, to try to improve our national and our homeland security intelligence system. Too many to, to talk about uh, here this morning, but a couple of things uh, I want to mention. Uh, we have a number of experiments uh, being run by what's called IARPA. That's the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Agency which is the intelligence community version of DARPA, that you may have heard of, the De Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which sponsors a lot of, of really good research in, in the academic world and in the, in the, the real, real world. And in Washington, that IARPA organization is sponsoring a number of different kinds of projects to help us improve our ability to forecast problems, forecast threats. They even have an office called the Office for Anticipating Surprise. Sounds like a neat organization. I'd love to, to get a job there sometime if I ever retire from my current gig. Um, but more important, we all, I think, hope that they're able to, to find ways of anticipating future threats today. And it's a good thing that we're able to, to try these sorts of things. We're trying to tap into social media in so many different ways. Both state and local and certainly federal agencies uh, are finding ways to tap into everybody's Facebook, Twitter posts, those sorts of things. We certainly know when it comes to natural disasters that relief agencies, government and non-governmental relief agencies in disasters in the United States and around the world have found that often the best information about where people are in the greatest need, what's happening on the ground today, the best information comes from social media, Twitter, Facebook, those sorts of things. And if it can work there, it can be useful as well uh, to keep us safe from domestic terrorism and other threats. But that does raise civil liberties concerns. And just in the last year or two, the major social media companies, Google, Facebook, and others, have taken steps to restrict the ability of third-party companies, other companies, that have, have sort of data mined their data and put it into packages that can be then bought by state and local and national intelligence and law enforcement agencies to try to get a feel for what's going on in social media, what, what do we hear uh, that, that might be coming up in, in terms of some sort of a threat? But because of those civil liberties concerns, it's harder today for law enforcement and intelligence agencies to get access to that information. And I think we have to have a, a better debate in this country about whether we want to give up a little bit more of our privacy in order to gain what may be some more security. And so far, I don't think we're having a very educated debate about that. And of course, many of our cities in the United States, around the world, are considering, are, are adopting wider scale, closed circuit TV systems. Uh, it's, it's not always clear that those systems really have much of a preventive role, a deterrence role, can be very useful in, after the fact, finding uh, who committed some sort of a crime.
but whether they can be preventive or not is, is a little bit unclear. We're making a lot of advancements in information sharing. You know, the old way in this country was uh, summarized here. I've got a quote from uh, an old school senator from Massachusetts uh, back during the Cold War, Leverett Saltonstall, and he used to say that there are some things that my government does that I don't want to know about. Well, today, you're never going to hear one of our uh, members of Congress, a senator, say that, and I don't think any of us would want to say that, especially about domestic issues. We believe today that we need to know more about what our government is doing. We've seen too many cases over, certainly in my lifetime, uh, where uh, our government has, has overstepped the bounds uh, and used its capabilities in ways that, that we realized was, was not correct. And so today we've set up new organizations and new concepts such as what's called the information sharing environment, where our federal agencies are trying to do a much better job of sharing information, such as one of the, the large, one of the sort of the bumper stickers or the, uh, the, the causes uh, that are believed to have allowed the 9-11 attacks to occur was that, as you probably remember, uh, that the FBI and the CIA weren't sharing the information that it had. We're trying hard today to make sure that, that we're, our agencies are able to share that information. But some folks would argue that maybe we're going too far. Maybe today we're sharing information too much and we're making information too available to too many people, including folks like Edward Snowden and others, who perhaps in the older days wouldn't have had access to as much information that he had. And he was able to, to use that access uh, to do what our national uh, intelligence, national security leaders have have said serious harm to the security of this country. So are we not sharing enough? Or are we sharing too much? Another area for, for debate. So let me just take a, a few more minutes to kind of sum up and then maybe we can have a little discussion uh, about this. Let me tell you what I think is some of the good news that is out there dealing with these, these threats and challenges. Based on the research that I have done, uh, and together with a number of others through that University of Maryland Counterterrorism Center called the START uh, organization, we have found that when we're looking at domestic terrorist attacks since 9-11, I've found that there have been 159 domestic terrorist attacks that have been fought, prevented since 9-11. And about a quarter of those were not related to radical Islamism, to jihadism at all. About a quarter have been associated with domestic right-wing, typically extremists, of the sort that FBI, law enforcement are very aware of, but I'm not sure that the people in our country are aware of. When we think of domestic terrorism threats, we typically think of, and rightly so, I can understand it, people who are inspired by foreign terrorist organizations, maybe a domestic uh, homegrown extremist, but usually there's some, we assume, some sort of connection to some sort of broader radical jihadist ideology. That often is the case, but not always. In about 25% where we've stopped something bad from happening, it's been from somebody who had no connection to anything like that. And what is it that has enabled us to prevent 159 domestic terrorist attacks since 9-11? My argument is that more often than not, the information that led to the uncovering of a plot or the prevention of an attack has been the sort of information that law enforcement gathers and does and works on every day. That intelligence, that information is close to home and it's largely based on aggressive law enforcement and using the tools that law enforcement has been using forever. Undercover uh, officers, informants, uh, legal wiretaps, those sorts of things that law enforcement does readily. The way I put it, the most effective tool for, or the tools for counterterrorism in our country are already in the toolbox of especially state and local law enforcement. And what we need to do is improve our ways of connecting our national level with our state and local level. As I see it, our state and local law enforcement authorities have a comparative, comparative advantage. That term you may have encountered in economics. State and local authorities tend to be better at, at understanding their local area. No surprise to law enforcement folks. They do a better job of keeping us safe. Another way to look at it, I like to, to think of it, this, this gets to that debate we, we hear about big data, should we use big data, is big data going to help us all, is it just going to uh, cause more problems? It's not big data that we need to keep us safe, it's little data. It's the precise, specific information about a terrorist plot, about a bad actor who is thinking about doing something, 
And usually, from our studies, open source, unclassified information of what has kept us safe and stopped plots from happening, usually it's come because somebody knew something and said something, or an undercover officer approached someone. Somebody reported that somebody else was on, on social media saying crazy things, and then there was an investigation and they stopped bad things from happening. We're stopping so many more plots than actually occur in this country. And it works because local, effort, local efforts, local agencies, are so much better suited uh, to keep their own community safe. And also, as I mentioned before, I believe it works better this way because local authorities and uh, local communities are better able to adjust uh, and sort of regulate what they do or calibrate what they do to fit the local concerns. Some areas of our country, some cities or some communities are more concerned about civil liberties. Others are, are more concerned about emphasizing the security side of things. The counterterrorism, the law enforcement approaches uh, that are taken in New York City are going to be quite different from those that are taken in San Francisco or Monterey or El Paso. So just to finish and then see if I'd like to talk about any of these things, what should we do about this? There have been many calls in recent years for, sometimes what is, you may remember this from the, uh, the presidential election, there are calls from, for an intelligence surge. What's an intelligence surge? I don't know, I'm not sure that anybody really knows, although maybe it sounds like a good thing for anybody in an intelligence studies program, or national security studies program. Many calls after attacks in the US, around the world, such as in France, we need better spying, we need more, more spying. I love this, as uh, somebody wrote an article, uh, argued that in order to help us all be safer, we need to hug a spy. I guess that sounds kind of nice anyway, I'm not sure if that's going to really happen. But at the same time, and this is where we get into these, these paradoxes and these challenges, we need to be aware of civil liberties concerns. I don't think the answer is just throw more money in into the intelligence business. Don't just have an intelligence surge because people on the Hill, People in our communities are understandably worried about the civil liberties uh, impacts of these things. So what do I think we need to do? Last, last uh, topic here, and we can open up a bit. I think, first of all, we need to have a better informed national debate about counterterrorism, homeland security, domestic intelligence. We need to talk about things such as, what is the right balance between security and liberty? Some would argue, the 9-11 Commission, in fact, argued that there didn't have to be a balance, that we can have, we need to have, must have, both security and liberty. I think that's impossible. You have to have some trade-offs. But in a democracy, when we're talking about using intelligence, law enforcement, homeland security efforts on our own people, on us, again, when, when the dots that we collect, the dots that we try to connect to prevent something bad from happening are you and me, we need to think about things differently from the way we think about them when they're overseas. We need to increase our efforts to share intelligence from the national level where we gather most of, of sort of that, that big data down to the state and local, local levels. And bring more programs down to the state and, and local levels, such as those state and local intelligence fusion centers. And overall, as a nation, as a people, we need to get over that allergy toward domestic intelligence. We need to have good de debates about it. We need to talk about it in our, commu in our communities. And discussions like we're having today, I, I hope, are, are a good start toward that better national debate. <coughs> That's all I've got on, on this one. Shall we uh, open up to questions, comments? What do you think about any of these topics? Please, um, this opportunity. Shall I go ahead and make a call? Yes, Dr. Please, please. please. Um, so a lot of the challenges that you were talking about when you think about like San Bernardino shooter, the Atlanta shooter, is that these are lone wolf individuals, so they're not affiliated with these larger groups. Do you feel like there is an increase in recent threats from lone wolf terrorists, and, and is that because there is no affiliation, is that that is the, one mm -hmm. of the challenges for, for us, uh, intelligence, yes. domestic intelligence? A absolutely. The question, in case everybody couldn't hear it, about lone wolves and, and uh, the sort of trajectory of, of the threat today, certainly uh, all of our national security, homeland security uh, officials and agencies are, are so concerned, our local agencies, about the lone wolf. Now, there's a, a significant debate and discussion about just what we mean when we're talking about lone wolves. Um, uh, and sometimes uh, that, that's, we can sort of split hairs about, about these things. For instance, it's interesting uh, in some of the studies that, that I've been a part of and that other 
uh, other scholars of terrorism uh, have uh, identified. Actually, in this country, there aren't that many true lone wolves. If you, by lone wolf, it means somebody who really just thinks of this on their own. Maybe they are inspired by by the web, media, or something like that. But but to be have somebody do it truly on their own without coordinating with somebody is actually quite unusual. That's a good thing. That's a good thing for law enforcement or for domestic security because, as we know, and, and this is part of that problem, when there is somebody who, without essentially without any warning, decides to do something terrible, there's very little that you can, can do about it other than then you're in, in sort of what in the military we call force protection, you know, a defensive posture. But the good news, if there, if there is any there, is that in fact, most of the cases of what appear to be lone wolves have, have been individuals who have talked to others about it. Of course, in many cases, uh, with that first law of intelligence failure, nobody reported it, or when it was reported, there just wasn't enough to go on. But, but so often, many of these plots, there are many more lone wolf plots that are disrupted by the, uh, they're reported in the press, uh, with the use of undercover officers, uh, confidential informants, those sorts of things. Those people aren't exactly lone wolves because they, they thought they were working with somebody who said, "Hey, I can I can get your bomb, uh, you know, you, and I'm 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 in connection with, with somebody from ISIS." But to finish up on that, uh, certainly this problem, however you define a lone wolf, is one of the biggest challenges that we are having today. I mean, certainly in my military intelligence career, I never expected. I don't think any of us ever expected that intelligence organizations, homeland security organizations, would be having to be thinking about how many high school kids in Minneapolis, El Paso, are going to be radicalized online uh, in the next year or so and try to get on an airplane to fly to Turkey or someplace to end up fighting for ISIS. That just it was never never on any of our radars. So, so the threat is certainly one of the biggest challenges today. Others, please. Please. With, with the instability going on around the world in different countries and the refugee and asylum cases going up, would you see it as a bigger threat for us here in the U.S. as far as then uh, more terrorists coming in mm -hmm. as that? For example, like in Africa or in Pakistan, mm -hmm. Afghanistan. Now, the question about uh, refugees and asylum seekers and, and how is that related to the threat, threat today, uh, certainly that's something that we hear about in the news all the time. And uh, from watching what, what happens in Europe, for instance, we all are understandably in this country concerned about the possibility of returned uh, jihadists, for instance, some of the returning foreign fighters, for instance, is often described. In this country, in the United States, though, a very, very small fraction of the attacks or of the thwarted plots uh, have been carried out by someone who has either come back, tried to come back from this country uh, from fighting abroad, or someone who has attempted to come, has come into this country illegally. The vast majority, I don't, don't have the, the numbers at my fingertips right now, but uh, most of the attacks in this country are carried out by people who are here legally, uh, by U.S. citizens so often, uh, and the problem is not so so much in this country with people who have come into this country illegally. Certainly there have been, been some, some cases, um, but, but I think that the, that threat has been sort of overblown within this, this country. In Europe, where borders are much more porous, where the idea of European unity over the last number of decades has been to open up Europe. Countries are, have open borders. It's so much easier for people to, uh, to travel from one country to the other. So the nature of the threat is different there. I think maybe we do need to take a break before we get to our second subject, right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.